Welcome back. Today we will discuss a finding uh, published just last week in Translational Psychiatry. Uh, this finding is quite amazing. Namely, it shows that auditory hallucinations are triggered by the superior temporal gyrus, specifically the voice responsive area in the superior temporal gyrus in schizophrenic patients. Uh, 25 years ago, we had no idea where in the brain auditory hallucinations were being produced. Now, we can identify clearly the connection that this particular area has with other brain regions. And in this paper, we uh, can now uh, have patients be trained with real-time neural feedback in an MRI machine to tune down the activity of this particular brain region, which then leads to a reduction in auditory hallucinations. So um, as a background here, we uh, need to go back to a paper published uh, some years ago, which established the fact that the superior temporal gyrus, in fact, is the critical area for producing auditory hallucinations. And in this particular article, repeated measurements of cerebral blood flow by fMRI to the superior temporal gyrus revealed that there is a tonic hyperactivity in patients with auditory hallucinations and was proposed as a trait marker, suggesting that patients who have this increased metabolic activity, in fact, might be uh, liable to experience auditory hallucinations. And here is a more detailed description of how this experiment was done. We will skip this in the interest of time and efficiency just to remind you that now there was evidence that a particular brain region was involved in triggering auditory hallucinations. Now, the evidence goes even back a little further, namely to the year 2000 when a paper appeared in Nature which established that in the human auditory cortex there is a voice selective area. Sounds, of course, are processed in the auditory cortex, but within the spectrum of sounds, there is a specific subregion in the superior temporal gyrus which responds selectively to that composition of sound and frequencies that correspond to the human spoken voice. That was established in this paper, and as you can see here, there is a clear demarcation of the um, auditory cortex here on the right and left side. Indicating that when um, subjects listen to a human voice, this particular area lit up, and it can be differentiated from those areas that respond to all other frequencies, such as white noise and other sounds that might be uh, transferred to this particular brain region. So let's get back now to our anchor paper, namely the real-time fMRI neurofeedback to downregulate the activity of this temporal, superior temporal gyrus in patients with schizophrenia a proof-of-concept study. So neurocognitive models and previous neuroimaging work have established that verbal auditory hallucinations arise due to increased activity in the speech-sensitive region of the superior temporal gyrus. So in this paper, then, the attempt was made to train patients to attempt to down-regulate this particular brain region in real-time neural feedback in the MRI machine. And in fact, patients were successful in learning to down-regulate the activity in their left SDG over the, um, um, over the training period. And post-training, patients showed increased functional connectivity between the left superior temporal gyrus, the inferior prefrontal gyrus, namely areas having to do with the motor systems for speech production, and the inferior parietal gyrus. So the post-training increase in functional connectivity between left SDG and IFG 
was associated with a reduction in audiovisual hallucination symptoms over the training period. So that then raises the possibility that this is a target for training patients to suppress their own auditory hallucinations. So here's a brief outline of the uh, protocol. On the left side, you see a rocket. The rocket lifts up and goes to space, and the patient associates a reduction in auditory hallucinations with a deceleration of the rocket, bringing it slowly down and down and down back to Earth. So that's the visual kind of stimulus that the patient can use to connect the inner experience. Whatever he or she is doing in the scanner to decrease the auditory hallucinations is accompanied by the visual signal of the rocket slowly descending. And that gives the patient an idea, where am I in my attempt to decrease the auditory hallucinations? So there's a baseline visit, of course, where the, the diagnosis is established and some rating scales are being conducted. And then in only four visits, uh, lasting perhaps nine minutes each in the scanner, the patient is successful in learning how to reduce auditory hallucinations. And furthermore, in a follow-up visit where no visual feedback was given, so the patient did not see the rocket decelerate, the patient yet was able to decrease the auditory hallucinations. So here again is the setup. You see that there is a scanner involved here. The data is uh, reduced and produced in real time so that the patient has a feedback that shows him uh, how much the activity in this particular brain region is reduced. And whatever the patient is doing internally within his inner experience, uh, reducing the voices, he has a visual feedback that allows him to enhance that particular technique that decreases the auditory hallucinations. And here's the finding. So you can see on the left-hand side the identification of the voice-sensitive area in the superior temporal gyrus, and in the bottom left brain you can see the particular decrease in activity. Now on the right-hand panel you can see that the activity of the auditory hallucinations progressively decreases from visit one through visit four. The last bar on the right-hand side is the transfer run. And the transfer run is still decreased uh, with, uh, in uh, comparison to the initial um, activity of the hallucinations before <coughs> this particular training began. So this is a very important criterion proving that you don't need to be in a scanner and have all these experiences here, like the feedback, and still you can show that the uh, technique has been internalized to reduce the auditory hallucinations. Now here is the other remarkable finding, namely there is a decrease, increase in connectivity of the speech sensitive area in the auditory cortex with Inferior, inferior frontal regions as well as parietal regions. Now the inferior frontal regions are of particular interest because those are the regions that you utilize to produce speech, that's the motor control of speaking. So somehow in connecting more strongly the motor output with the sensory center for speech perception, you can decrease the uh, automaticity of auditory hallucinations. So somehow this feedback seems to be quite essential. Now, to summarize then, in this pioneering study, um, there is uh, evidence that patients with schizophrenia and auditory hallucinations can downregulate the activity of the superior temporal gyrus, which is associated with a decrease in auditory hallucinations. Furthermore, this training resulted in increased functional connectivity between frontal and temporal language regions that was associated with changes in auditory visual hallucinations, symptom severity. Now finally, we want to connect this to yet another idea, namely the idea of a Bayesian approach to uh, explaining positive symptoms of schizophrenia, not only hallucinations, but also delusional belief systems. 
So the Bayesian approach says the following. We all built models of the world in our brain. And in order to make sense of the causal events in the environment, in the world, we use fresh incoming sensory stimuli and compare them to our existing model in the world and we will somehow detect error signals. When things don't match, we need to uh, correct, we need to downgrade the error signal, we need to minimize the error signal by either uh, gaining new observations or perhaps even changing the model that we have laid down in the brain before. Now how might this apply to the decrease in auditory hallucinations in this particular experiment? Well, if you don't have good connectivity between the motor regions of the speech apparatus to the sensor region, then the sensor region can run wild and do its own thing and not be receptive to feedback from the environment. So internal speech that we all engage in, if not connected to the speech apparatus, uh, is not being exposed to error signals that can be used to modify the model and the activity of the entire circuitry. And here is the connectivity. On the top model here, you see the normal connectivity of the sensory speech area to more frontal um, motor speech areas. And at the bottom, you see a number of patients with schizophrenia, and you can see that the connectivity between the sensory area and the motor area is significantly decreased in patients with schizophrenia. In other words, this will predict that the sensory auditory cortex is not as well maintained and exposed to normal feedback signals that it would otherwise achieve in a normal person. So this experiment then suggests a number of overarching themes, the major one being that the um, uh, Bayesian approach to brain functioning or predictive coding, which claims that we compare constantly models we have laid down in our brain with incoming sensory signals in order to decode causal activity in the environment, is somehow disruptive in schizophrenic patients. And this then may account not only for hallucinatory activity, but also for the creation and maintenance of delusional beliefs. We have previously talked about the Bayesian brain, and we will expand on this in future talks in some more detail, as this might provide a very powerful tool in understanding symptom formation in schizophrenia. Thank you very much for your attention, and we see you soon again at Behavioral Health 2000.